welcome to the 18th episode of season 4 of the Ubuntu UK podcast. It's Tuesday the 25th of October 2011 and in this episode we're going to talk about ICT in schools and we'll do another of our quizzes. Yay. Yay. We, we will of course... Y-E-Y. Co- <laughs> <laughs> we will of course cover the latest news events, bit about Ubuntu, come on line love and go over your feedback. I'm Laura and with me this week are Mark. Hello. Alan. Hello. And Tony. Good evening. And the cat. So, what have you been up to, Mark? I went to the Science Museum. Ooh. It was cool and very geeky. I spent a lot of time reading about Charles Babbage's difference engine and the Pegasus computer and things like that. The first computer my dad ever worked on is now in the Science Museum. Really? The actual computer Mm -hmm. itself? Yeah, I don't know what it was, but... We saw it there when we were little. And we I went. think Mark said the Babbage. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and there's, they've got this sort of computer art installation, which is absolutely amazing, called the Listening Post, which is basically um, a sort of like an array of little LCD scrolling screens and a load of speakers hooked up to um, a feed, which they pull from various like IRC channels and um, public message boards oh, and wow. stuff. And it like, so it's got seven different algorithms it uses to pick out phrases. So like one of them picks just phrases which start with I am or I'm and like does three minutes of scrolling through them and it picks out like just other ones which just seem to pick out random bits of conversation and just displays them to music. And Can you just sit at home and watch Twitter? <laughs> <laughs> Not the same experience, I assure oh, okay. you. <laughs> oh, that sounds like fun though. Cool. Did you go alone or was it a group thing? Or no, I went school with my girlfriend. Or, oh, okay. Did you did she try and leave you there? <laughs> <laughs> she did um, try and lose me on a couple of occasions. Yeah, yeah. In front of the shiny lights. Yeah. <laughs> so, Alan. Hello. Hello. I went to the release party um, for Oneric Ocelot in London at a very, very hot pub called The Cask. And it was good. Loads of people turned up. We had loads of beer, loads of good chatting and some food and stuff. And it was really, really good, as always. Cool. Tony? Hmm. Uh, I have upgraded something to a Neric. Something? Well, Your cat? My cat, no, who is just <laughs> trying to interfere. Um, <laughs> this netbook specifically, the one that is now running our sound effects for the show. So good luck, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> um, but testing a few apps as well before I upgrade my desktop, make sure they all work okay. Apparently um, Java, the Sun Java, is not going to be packaged for uh, 11.10. Uh, it isn't a package for 11.10. You mean an Oracle Java? Yeah, Oracle Java. <laughs> You can still, the natty one still works, but obviously if it's not going to be updated, then it's going to be a problem eventually. Mm. Oh, cool. Why, is there stuff that you've got that's Java? Oh, you have that. There's a couple of um, photography apps that are Java-based that don't seem to play well with the uh, open JDK thing. Have you filed bugs? Not yet, but I've only just started to test them. Oh, so okay. Because I, I, I remember more. someone recently saying that when they were talking about uh, removing Oracle Sun Java from the repositories and the reason why it should be removed is because Oracle JDK works perfectly now and there's no reason for people to use the Sun one. And yet I, that okay. conflicts with all the experience I've ever had. But then I think when Open JDK doesn't work on my machine, I just switch to the Sun one and I don't file a bug. Mm. And I think that's probably mm. why. Yeah, quite possibly. Mm-hmm. Mm. What Laura? have you been up to, Laura? Uh, I went to the Ubuntu happy hour. Oh, you did, yeah. didn't you? Yes. Yes. Well, you did yeah. my local, yeah. conveniently enough. Yes. It was yes. good, wasn't it? Yes, I ate lots of crisps and yeah. fries. It, Alan had conveniently chosen a pub that didn't do food in the evenings. It did, <laughs> it did beer, which was the prerequisite. Beer is not a food. How many times <laughs> do I want to tell you? It's well. not one of your five a day. <laughs> <laughs> well, yes. That no, was rather good. Alan was, Bell organised it, didn't he? Uh, yeah, he's a, he start, kicked off the whole happy hour thing. And um, so we had one in London, then this one in Farnborough. And then the next one, I think, is in Nottingham. Nottingham. Um, and, and they're looking for other places around the UK. So if you're an Ubuntu user and you're somewhere in the UK... And you like going to pubs. Uh, well, and you, well, it actually doesn't have to be a pub, but they thought well, pubs would be a good idea. Um, find a venue and um, put a slot, put a venue in the slot, and we'll, um, some people will turn up. It was really good. I really liked chatting to people I'd not spoken to before. Yeah, there were a couple of new faces and things there, mm. so it was nice. And some old friends. And some old friends. Outside of the pressure cooker of Og Camp, it was good to, to <laughs> chat to people. I'm hoping to uh, persuade Crystal to help basically organise Og Camp so I don't have to do anything next time. Oh, around. there's going to be another Og Camp, is there? Apparently, if Crystal You heard it here it, first. <laughs> if Crystal does it, there will be. Anybody got anything else? Nope. Everybody's done an Eric. 
Yeah. Yeah. Okay. We're all up to date. Let's get on with the show. So uh, recently there's been, uh, yes, I know, I'm good at starting these segments. Um, there's been some discussion online about um, the appalling state of ICT in education. Um, I don't know if that's necessarily just UK based. It seems um, a pan global thing. Mm. Um, and uh, I wanted to pose a couple of questions. The first one being, can projects like the Raspberry Pi, the small computer thing, um, and Google Coding help to revitalize ict or are we on a downward spiral or actually is ict in um education actually not a problem at all and we're looking back on the past with rose tinted spectacles well there was a news article we covered a couple of shows ago i think the mark wasn't there about um google eric schmidt saying something yeah he basically said that that he's like amazed that we don't teach computer science as a standard in school we teach ict which is not exactly the same mm. and doesn't really give you any skills in terms of how a computer works it teaches you how to use microsoft applications so but, so but we don't teach people how a microwave works and we don't teach people how a video recorder or a dvd works we teach people how to use them and shouldn't computers be a tool that you use like a microwave or a dvd player but they are capable of a lot more than a microwave or okay in relative terms they're capable of a lot more than a microwave and okay a computer can't microwave your food yes um <laughs> can if you leave it behind the uh, rear port um yeah there's a lot more that you can do i mean it's you're saying like a microwave is an appliance a yeah. computer I never see a computer as an appliance. I see a computer as a toolbox. Sure. But, but a lot uh, of people don't. Yeah, my mum doesn't. Um, and, and if you were to buy one of those Chromebooks where you turn it on and there's a browser, that seems to be a single-use device. Okay, there's there's lots of different uses you can make with the browser. Mm. You can play games, you can do your spreadsheets, you can email and communicate. But it is a, it has a single purpose, really, which is to do your computing for you. But you could possibly extend the criticism, not specifically to microwaves, but to engineering in general. Damn those microwaves. Uh, well, you don't need to be learning how a microwave works, but you could be learning very basic stuff at a, in engineering. To, I don't know like what. I don't know what's basic Cars. in engineering. Okay, yeah. You could learn, learn how, how your car works. works. So if your car breaks down, you, you probably can can't fix, fix it. it anywhere these days. Great, we get onto the car analogy already. <laughs> Brilliant. But well, it's, yeah, you, it, yeah. There's a difference between what most people are going to need to do. And sure enough, back back in the day, you know, computing was programming and, and, and you know, taking PCs apart, that sort of thing. When you say back in the day, you're saying as if, uh, when, as if people... When you were a lad, Alan. People don't take computers apart now and they don't program them now, people well, in general. Well, no, but as a proportion of the computer-using population, it's a lot smaller percentage than it was back in the day. Because I don't think it Back is. in the day, he says, using air quotes... Everybody who used a computer was a programmer. Because okay, so that's if you're, you got, because that's all there was. Yeah, but if you're going frames. back to the um, Altair eighty eighty, where you had to flip switches on the front to boot the thing, I would, yeah, I'll let yeah. you have that one. But as soon as you <sighs> skip forward five, head. five maybe ten years to home computing in the terms of when I was a kid, like Sinclair Spectrum, ZX eighty one, I wasn't a programmer. Okay, you could. <laughs> Typing something in from a magazine doesn't make you a programmer. Aww. <laughs> no, I'm no, sorry no. to say. I was hoping that would count. <laughs> and and so, you, but even then, you might not do that. Only an enthusiast would buy a magazine and type a game in. Most people would go to the newsagents or the record shop and buy a game on a cassette and put it in. Yeah. And they're using that as an appliance. I think there is a, an element of rose-tinted spectacles that we're looking back and saying, wasn't it the heady days of, you know, typing in your own programs in in a computer and i think actually the proportion of people was still small back then that to, did programming yeah to be fair i think one of the greatest achievements i made was working out how to use the word processor which wasn't WYSIWYG. 
At on, one what, stage. on a spectrum? No, on a BBC Macro at one stage. Okay, so you're using an appliance. You're, yeah. You're, and what you were it was doing just harder. <laughs> is well, yeah. <laughs> you do. You didn't have F1 help probably, yeah. or uh, yeah, you had nice. to type commands to get the uh, font, the formatting. You probably didn't have a little paperclip pop up and ask you if you were making a document. Or no, it wasn't like annoying. That. It, it sounds like you struggled almost as much as Mark did trying to use my microwave last week when he came around trying to make his tea here yeah which was <laughs> well, which, the appliance argument goes out the window when a developer struggles to use a microwave i think well yeah, it's a fish out of water isn't it um, uh, <laughs> if, if you've got an engineer for, who, who knows the in intricacies of a car engine in yeah. to to use a microwave they would have the same problem so I, I'm not convinced that the, the education is in as bad a state as people make it out so between us we cover about 20 years of well 20 years Plus. elapsed since schooling yeah um, so alan <laughs> what did you learn at school in terms so of it the first computer i think i used at school was probably a bbc micro mm, me too um yeah yeah almost certainly a bbc micro and they had a whole bunch of them it was around about the time when they came out and actually i think the older kids used them and, and we we didn't get much much time to play with them <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> we were the chairs you know sit on us and the toast rack <laughs> um and then later it was pcs but even like because i'm an enthusiast i would program them but there were plenty of other people who didn't who mm. who would use it for things like prestel and who used applications and and the first m mouse and windowy stuff and there were people who were artists using it as an application they weren't they, I don't. I don't think there was a vast proportion of my classmates who were programmers in the making. No, I think I remember people in my class when I was about nine or ten being really impressed because I could type fast, <laughs> and that was just because I used a computer at home. But most people didn't. I still think that there's a place for um, people learning office application skills not necessarily microsoft office but you know generic how to use a spreadsheet how to use a wordpress skills there's a problem when people can't get access to computing in either sort of system administration mm. technical or development skills when they want to yeah and as far as i'm aware there is next to no uh, actual sort of de development or advanced computer skills in uh keys up to key stage three in the uk which is just uh, gcse's and it's there's not a huge amount after that isn't it mostly self-taught? You get you get the people who who have like there's there's always going to be like one or two people in the class who already have a computer before everyone else and already know a, a, a like a, a page or two ahead of the rest of the class, maybe even a page or two ahead of the teacher. And so they're the people who go around helping and oh, when you get this error, just press this button or you know, have you tried rebooting? That sounds that? scarily familiar. That was basically what my gcse it class was like exactly and and so you are one out of what your gcse class would have been 20 or 30 people yeah. in a class and i'm pretty sure that one out of 30 is probably a pretty good um ratio of yeah. it nerds to normal people <laughs> if that makes sense <laughs> just to be you know. and i know i was probably the closest out of our class i think thinking back and i wasn't programming other than the very occasional class we had Mm. I think Eric Schmidt's point was that in order to get the high quality computer scientists you know, at, through university and beyond and into companies like Google, you need to have uh, an infrastructure there to give them the opportunity to, to learn, to flex their wings, to play with systems that perhaps they haven't got access to at home. Now, OK, you can have a development environment on an ancient PC and still learn stuff in Python or C or whatever. Um, so it's perhaps less of a problem than it used to be. But you know, to give them the support to actually learn the fundamentals of computer science, it's it's difficult these days. Yeah, but but why why are we focusing on computer science? There are other skills that people need to be taught at school, like um, social skills, how to deal with um, other, how to interact with other people in a like work environment, and um, how to uh, manage your finances. Yeah, you know, <laughs> st stuff as fundamental as you know balancing the books and yeah. and that kind of stuff. Not you know deep maths and deep accountancy but but some pretty fundamental things that i i think people should know before they go down the road of learning python don't get me wrong i think it would be great <laughs> if my kids learn how to program that would be great and i'll probably take care of that but equally there's loads of other skills i'd like them to have as well and i i don't know if there's enough time in the curriculum for all of that stuff mm. something has to go that's true and i think where we've seen uh, new subjects like citizenship um, and some of the softer skills coming into the curriculum, it has perhaps pushed out some of the harder science 
subjects in general. There's, been a, there's a move away from what they call STEM subjects, so science, technology, engineering, maths, and there's a big push to try and get people back into them. Yeah, I was going to say, if it's if you extend it to wider engineering and physical sciences and stuff, then, you know, I I didn't know what engineering involved when I was looking at universities, so I would never have even picked it, probably. Well, I didn't, but, <laughs> you know, I didn't even consider it because I had no idea what it involved. But then the other side is... is when you were talking about like your car, the engineering analogy for cars, why why should we teach um, people the intricacies of how a combustion engine works when there are other people who are passionate about that and who will go and find that information themselves and you pay them money and they do that for I don't, you? I don't think it's specifically cars, but it's that kind of people understanding how things work mm -hmm. it doesn't have to be they have to know how a car works in order to be able to fix it it's just useful to be able to understand how things work but because that might get people interested then in doing it later or it might not don't you have to have a natural curiosity you know that i was the kind of kid who took a radio apart and it never worked again <laughs> but, but you know i know some Unsoldered people soldered all the components yes, off the board yes made a big pile of capacitors <laughs> big pile of resistors and then try and put it back you together my brother <laughs> and and so there are certain people who are that passionate that they want to know how stuff works. I never took but then things... the most most people don't, do they? they don't I never really care. took things apart. I think I was too I'd be too scared of things like Tony's just killing the car. <laughs> <laughs> He's opening it up to see how it works. <laughs> <laughs> things like warranties and stuff, they bother me too much. But um yeah, well, yeah like being, teaching people how to read a legal document. Oh, yeah. You know, we sign these all the time and we click through, like, legal agreements all the time. Nobody, like, really know, understands the intricacy of this kind of stuff unless you're, you know, someone who works for the um, Software Freedom Law Centre or, you know, you're, you're some qualified lawyer. That, that kind of skill would be as useful as knowing how, you know, the inside of a cat works. But or... I didn't do that. <laughs> I didn't do the kind of pulling things apart thing, but I really enjoyed watching stuff like Coroners. Do you remember nope. Corners nope. with Sophie Aldred? Sophie Aldred, yeah. yeah. Um, it, was, it was just, well, I don't know if it was the we whole programme, but there were, every time there was like a visit to a, a rock-making factory in Blackpool and it told you how they got the letters through the rock. <laughs> oh, right. Loads of how-to stuff. You mean... And I, that rock. always fascinated me, like how, I don't know, baked bean cans get labelled, you know, really yeah, random I, everyday stuff yeah. and how-to, and that did, in, that did interest me. But if that sort of thing wasn't available, I, you know, maybe I wouldn't have questioned it, I don't know. One of the things that Big Red S is mentioning in the hash Ubuntu dash UK dash podcast IRC channel on the Freenode IRC network. We're going to run out of time. Are you going to actually say it now? It just trips <laughs> off the tongue, doesn't it? <laughs> um, he, so, he says that, uh, or he thinks that the uh, absence of sort of slightly intermediate technical skills, so people understand the basics of how email works or what a firewall is and does, um, or how basic encryption works for secure transactions and things on the net is would make a big difference mm. just to you know the lives of everybody on, on the internet mm. as good citizens good netizens um and make everybody's life a bit easier if you're a support technician and there's some <laughs> sense in that actually it, yeah, it's, it's the agree. next step up the ladder isn't it just sort of a basic understanding of some of these principles yeah and we have kind of dumbed down computers to the point where you know there's this box and you type stuff in a box and it disappears and appears somewhere else and you don't really need to know like if if you open something like um thunderbird now and you go through the setup wizard it doesn't ask you for your smtp server or your imap server it it asks you for your email account and it tries to figure it all out for yeah. you because these words are scary and weird and i don't understand them and let's get a man in who knows about these things well i've worked as a an it technician and things in the past and i still manage a group of people who are and you you hear you know, these sort of vague descriptions of a problem. It's like, yeah, my email's gone away or, you know, my internet's not working. Yeah, but that's from me. Yeah. <laughs> that's not just Laura. Um, but it, 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 it's a very simplistic des uh, description of the problem, but it also indicates that actually there's not really any understanding of w what the components of the system yeah. might be that might even point them in the right direction. I'm not entirely sure it's just um, school. I think there's... Um, parents should take some responsibility for teaching their kids stuff and one thing that i've noticed at schools where my kids go the kids who get talked to by their parents who, whose parents talk to them a lot and talk to them about stuff and when the kid asks how how something works or what something is rather than palm them off with its magic or you know <laughs> oh i don't know ask your dad then the people who actually get stuff explained to them seem to have a bit more of a clue and a bit more something about them and mm. and i i think parents are 
not doing their responsibility of educating their kids. It's not just down to schools to do this kind of stuff. Parents need to take some responsibility for it as well. Just general families, I guess. Yeah, well, yeah, even like the the crusty old granddad who used to take things apart years ago, he can teach you, you know, stuff like this. But then if the kids now aren't being taught this stuff, how are they going to teach their kids? Mm. So surely there needs to be some sort of... If, if the, well, skills, aren't, if the it's, skills aren't in the sort of food chain in the first place, <laughs> to come up with a terrible analogy, yeah, yeah no, um, that's good. Then, you know, then surely they need to be introduced from somewhere. And if mm. there aren't enough people at the moment to introduce them, then it has to come from the school, surely. Mm, perhaps. Okay, well, if you uh, want to let us know your thoughts about uh, education and computing and computer science and ICT in schools and uh, where you think the next generation of wizards is going to come from, computer wizards, that is not just wizards. Uh, <laughs> That's how it works. <laughs> get in touch, podcast at ubuntu-uk.org or via any of the methods that we're going to read out at the end of the show or you can find on our website. time for the news good (laughs) we are organized honestly astrolabe the company suing the volunteers who formerly maintained the time zone database for copyright infringement has issued a statement responding to the large amount of correspondence it received following the filing fancy that astrolabe state that their intention isn't to disrupt the maintenance of the database or collect a large sum for damages but instead to make its concerns over the infringement clear to arthur olsen and paul eggert who maintain the database meanwhile ICANN have agreed to take over responsibility of the database's maintenance have that astrolabe (laughs) <laughs> well good on I can and they think of sending him a letter without having a lawsuit attached to it might have worked you never know yeah mm. <laughs> yeah <laughs> you can make your point in another way without a lawsuit <laughs> I know it's a contradiction in terms in America Google and Samsung have announced Android 4 code name Ice Cream Sandwich really and the Galaxy Nexus the next pure Google smartphone Features include speech-to-text, an enhanced camera, facial recognition and near-field communication. The facial recognition thing looked cool until Mark pointed something out. Yeah, if you've sort of taken a picture of your face for it to recognise, then surely someone could show the the camera a picture of you, like a photograph of you, and it would unlock your phone. Yeah, I was less impressed then. (laughs) (laughs) Well, the fact that it didn't work in their demo very well. (laughs) Yes, that wasn't very smooth. What's near field communication? Um, Like an oyster oyster card. Like a card you get into public transit. transit. Bulk transit. Bulk transit. Transit your bulk. I use those. (laughs) (laughs) Microsoft Research, the company's division for inventing cool stuff, have created a holodesk. Holodesk. A device allowing users to view and manipulate 3D digital objects with physical interaction. And this is very cool. Yes. Will it be something that will cost less than a million pounds and I can have next year? No. No. But Not it's really cool. It's in research. <laughs> Watch the video. You it is be... very cool. It's like you can put your hand in and you've got physical hand, juggle, virtual juggling balls. So is this, this it's like, what's it called? Um, uh, augmented reality. Hmm. It's yeah. got Headed gravity. Way, I think. Headed no, it's got it's gravity. It's just advanced augmented reality. It's, it's yeah. more like the holodeck in Star Wars. Star Trek. Oh, Star, that's Star Wars, oh, like dear. the chess. No, no, don't say. Oh, the holo chess. Star Trek. Star Trek. No, in, Tra- in Star Wars. What? Oh, okay. Oh, in the uh, holo chess. Yeah, okay. 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 Um, where well, well, you can move it. them around. But um, yeah, then you're juggling with these virtual juggling balls, or you can get a physical cup and pick up the virtual ball in it, move it around, and drop it. Could, would it be cheaper to just get real balls? Well, if we had that, we wouldn't. No imagination. No, I haven't. I haven't. Matthew Garrett of Red Hat has blogged fleshing out uh, the issues and opinions surrounding Microsoft's management of the UEFI, that's U E F I, secure boot on Windows 8 certificate hardware. Garrett's current position is that the (laughs) UEFI. What? What? UEFI. UEFI. Yeah. How? How should we say that? U E F I. Yeah specification should be modified to allow signing keys to be included on removable devices such as install media allowing alternative OS's to be booted securely so this is some hope isn't it after the last time we talked about yeah. oh, it's all the world's going to end um, when Windows 8 comes out now it might be okay if they adopt this spec and implement it hope so fingers crossed 
Following the successes of the annual Summer of Code, Google has announced Google Coding, a similar project aimed at pre-university students. Participants will be able to earn points in return for contributions. Yeah, I know you were going to say prizes, Tony. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we'll, we'll do that again. Partici- participants will be able to earn points in return for prizes to open source projects, which will in turn earn them <laughs> t-shirts and cash. See, prizes. 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 The contest starts on the 21st of November. And there's been a post that uh, I think Daniel sent to the Ubuntu Devil to try and get people to mentor this and find people who would be interested in um, contributing. Yeah. So Summer of Code is for graduates and things, isn't yes. it? And yeah. uh, this is for people... No, well, not Summer, yeah, Summer of Code is for Sorry. university students. Yeah, yeah undergraduates. undergraduates. Yeah. Okay. Well, sounds like a good plan. Mm. Alan, you want to say that FOSDEM's happening in February? No. Okay, that's the end of the news and events. <laughs> <laughs> That's me. <laughs> We're slick. <laughs> and now it's time for some command line love. Tell us your command, Mark. I command Don't. you. Tell us what it does. To type in export PS1 equals and then some, some other stuff. characters. Basically, um, PS1 is a variable, environment variable. That's what it is, That's which which tells the shell what to display at the prompt. So you can put all sorts of cool stuff in there. So usually what does it say? Username at hostname or something in yes. the path. Yeah. And then some characters which may indicate what sort of user you're logged in as. Oh, a dollar like sign or whatever. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. So it really has a, a hash sign. So what's yeah. this specific one you've got here, dude? Uh, I don't know. I didn't type that in, but it looks like it just... It shows the IP address of ah, the computer instead of just the host name um, in the prompt. So uh, if you need to know the IP address of the machine you're connecting from, it will be displayed in the prompt. With the host name or just the IP? Uh, this one just does the IP address, but you could put both in there if you really wanted to. Mm. One thing I do with this work, which is really handy, is when I'm uh, working with, uh, if, if I'm in a directory which has a Git repository for version control in, it will show me what branch I'm on and whether there's any changes or additions or removals from the you see, that would be a commit. much better command I love. Why didn't you put that one in? Uh <laughs> <laughs> you're, that, you're, you're still implying that I put this in. Oh. I'm just reading it out. Okay. Does that thing show you when you've deleted three months worth of work and not realised it? No. Okay. Does it tell you if your backups? At least with this, one, <laughs> at least with this one, you know what server you were on when you deleted all your work. Yes, but it would only work if I noticed before three months later. Yeah. I, yeah, I use the um, Biobu thing, yeah. the screen thing down the bottom, and that gives me oodles of information. Yeah. Some of which is actually. I've got in the prompt, like the username and hostname, some of that's mm. down the bottom of the screen. Mm. So I could probably shrink my little prompt down a little bit and get a bit of real estate back. Yeah. But I'm not that bothered. There's no. an, um, another program called Bashish, which I think I sent in as a command line love about Season three, years three ago, I think, yeah. Aww. Which which basically does sort of crazy stuff with this, which like you will turn your prompt into a snake snaking down the side of the screen and other like eye candy. And other stuff really like useful Other tweets. really useful stuff. Okay. Excellent. Okay. All right. Well, we need to thank the people from commandlinefoo.com where we nicked that, that one from. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Something like that. And that's the end of the command line love. Okay. It's back. It's the return of the rounds of quizzes. The triumphant return. The triumphant return. Those of you who have listened since the beginning of the season will remember that we each hosted a round of a quiz uh, in a segment and we thought we would have a second round before the season ends before Christmas. So we thought we'd better get a wriggle on. Excellent. Yes. So it's my turn to host this one um, and I'm going to be doing another instance of who wants to be a massive Ubuntu geek. (laughs) As, it, as it's well known. So you're yeah. currently winning at the moment. Yeah, we need to go back and double check the scores, but I'm pretty sure that I'm winning. However, as I'm hosting this one, I can't participate. So the three contestants will be Laura, So there's Mark. everything to play for. Yeah. Yeah, especially for me. <laughs> <laughs> we, we can't remember the exact scores. We know Mark won, has won at least one. We know Laura has won none. none. <laughs> uh, um, I've won a couple at least. So, um, yeah, so Laura, Mark and Alan are going to be participating this time around. The format is very similar, but legally different from the Who Wants to Be a Millionaire format. <laughs> Copyright for Endemol. <laughs> In this version of the quiz, each contestant is asked a series of questions which start easy but get harder. 
Each question has four possible answers. For each question they get right, the contestant gets a point. Uh, each contestant has two lifelines, which they can use at any time. The lifelines are 50-50 and Ask IRC. So you're going to have to ask <laughs> you to avert your gaze from the IRC channel until you need to refer oh, to them. Ask out. IRC with a 30-second delay, isn't it? There's a little bit of it. You get a few seconds. It's all right, I've got a music bed. <laughs> <laughs> Some pointless noises to play out for a while. Um, when a contestant gets a question wrong, they're out of the competition. There's a maximum of six questions. and uh, basically Is that the total number you thought of? Uh, for each, each. Oh, for each. Yeah. Okay. So that would be where the million pounds is at the end of the six questions. We haven't wow. got a million pounds, so yeah. Basically. Am, That's when I am disappointed. You are disappointed. Yep. So basically, the further you get in, uh, the person who gets the most questions right wins. Right. So it's fairly straightforward. And you've got two lifelines. Six questions to get right. And we're going to start this time around with Laura. Are you ready, Laura? Uh. Have, you, <laughs> have you hidden IRC? Yes. Okay. So, question number one, Laura. To which singer is Ubuntu UK podcast presenter Alan Pope most regularly compared? <laughs> <laughs> is it A, Elvis, B, Tom Jones, C, Mark Owen, or D, Cheryl Cole? <laughs> oh. A, Elvis. Are you sure? Yes. Final answer? Yes. <laughs> yes. Well done. Is that okay. the jingle we're going to get really sick of very soon? Only if you get it right. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> to be fair, that could have been it for Laura. <laughs> oh, yeah. Okay, well done. You got that one right. Alan is compared with Elvis most regularly. Next question, question number two. How long is an LTS release of Ubuntu supported for on the desktop? Okay. How long is an LTS release of Ubuntu supported for on the desktop, the current LTS release? Do I get options? You get the options. The options are A, one year, B, two years, C, three years, and D, four years. B, two years. B, two years. Yes. Supported on the desktop. Final answer? Yes. Are you sure? Yes. Okay. Let's see whether you're right. Let's see whether two years is the right answer. <laughs> <laughs> Building up the tension. <laughs> building up something. Oh. Well, that was quick. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that ends it. Uh, well, for, for Laura. Me. Oh. For Laura, unlucky. Yeah. The correct answer was C, oh, three, years three years on the desktop, but uh, they just announced that the next version is going to be supported for five years. We'll be talking about that more yeah. in a minute. I'm sure we will be. I'd have guessed four years if I'd thought about it. <laughs> you would still have been wrong. Yeah. No so, way. If I yeah, thought no. about it. Hey ho. A uh, a triumphant return for Laura to, <laughs> to the quizzing. Yeah. Oh well, at least I wasn't out on the first one. No, you got you, you got the question that had nothing to do with Ubuntu yes. at all. Right. Yes. There we go. I know my community stuff though. Yeah. Okay. Right. So next question set is for Mark. Hello. Mark Johnson. Are you ready, Mark? Ready as I'll ever be. Have you come a long way today? <laughs> Have, are your family in the audience? Uh, oh yeah. <laughs> hey Mark. Yes, that's my uncle Kevin from up north. <laughs> <laughs> Has he got a cough? Is he going to cough when the right answer comes up? Okay. First question: The Kubuntu derivative of Ubuntu uses which desktop environment? Is it A GNOME three? Is it B XFCE? Is it C KDE? Or is it D, LXDE? <laughs> I think it's C, KDE. Are you sure about that? I'm fairly sure. Okay. I'll be honest. Final answer. <laughs> Hooray! You. Well done, Mark. Thank you. You still have both your lifelines. <laughs> the next question for Mark is, what is the name of the Windows Ubuntu installer? Is it A, Wooby? Is it B, Zuby? <laughs> is it C? That's not fair. Pooby? <laughs> or is it D, Luby? The Windows Ubuntu installer. I know this one. Um, it's A, Wooby. Are you sure? Yes. Is that your final answer? Yes. Okay. Let's see whether you're right. Final answer. You said Wooby. And I was right. Okay. Hey. 
Okay. Okay. You made it through two. You've beaten Laura by by a point already. Yes. Uh. So, <laughs> this is where things start to get more serious now. How much free storage space does one get on Ubuntu One? Is it A, two gigabytes, B, three gigabytes, C, four gigabytes, or D, five gigabytes? D, five gigabytes. Oh, he's straight in there. Is that your final answer? Are you really sure about that? I'm not 100% sure, but I'm pretty damn sure. Okay. Let's see. Well, you're right. You said five gigabytes of those four options you chose. You chose the biggest one. I did. I chose it? the biggest one. Yes. And you got it right. Oh, that's a relief. You look visibly relieved. <laughs> okay. Oh, really? Next question. <laughs> Three questions right, three questions to go. You have both your lifelines. Okay. <clears throat> Which one of these is not a package available in the Ubuntu archives? Ooh. Is it A, tux type? Is it B, type speed? Is it C, rand type? Or is it D, touch type? Oh, that's hard. Um... I think I'm going to ask IRC. Okay, you've chosen to ask IRC. Perhaps Alan could um, uh, oh, monitor okay. the responses. and I, I shall keep an eye on IRC. Okay. Right, so, so hold the, on. Am I allowed to look at IRC? Yeah, you can look at IRC. I as well. can look yeah, at IRC. Yeah. Yeah. Right, do I need to type the question into IRC? And hopefully they're listening. Heard it by now. Otherwise, so uh, we've had some answers already. Okay. Okay. One, Pangolin, <laughs> interestingly, has come up with <laughs> Rand the- type. Okay, so sorry, can you just repeat the question for me? So the question is, for you and for anybody listening on IRC, which one of these is not a package in the Ubuntu archives? A, tux type. B, type speed. C, rand type. And D, touch type. As Mark tries to fire up a browser and go to packages.ubuntu. I'm only in IRC. I believe you. Um, Okay. (laughs) Oh dear. I think we've had oh, we've had a few conflicting responses. I'm sure one at least one of them has gone off to packages.ubuntu.com and put well, it I'm, sort of, I'm sort of hoping that's what they've done to be honest. Um okay. <laughs> Putting everything in. I'm I'm going to go with oh You've had every single I've option. Had every single <laughs> one. They're, re- they're really helpful, aren't they? Thank yeah. you, listeners. Okay, I'm going to go with Oh god. <laughs> <laughs> Can I go 50-50, please? You want to go 50-50? <laughs> yes. Okay. So we're going to take away two wrong answers, leaving you with one wrong answer and the correct answer. Yes. This is your last lifeline you've got to you, to, to lose and use. Okay, so the two answers we're going to take away are A and B, tux type and type speed. Right. Which means that the two options you're left with are rand type and touch type. Um, very well. Uh... <laughs> I will go with touch type. Okay. You're going to run out of music bed in a minute. I'm wondering how long it is, actually. <laughs> okay, so touch type's your final answer. Yes. <laughs> For the million pounds. <laughs> <laughs> oh. oh. Thank you, Pangolin in IRC. Wow. I think this means that you made it further than you did last time as well, which is really good. Brilliant. Okay, so you've got no lifelines left now, and you're oh, on to and the, I've got the ridiculously hard question. Fifth, Good-o. the fifth of six questions. You might, you know, you might get it right. Yep. Still a one in four chance, even if you just take pot luck. <laughs> I like those odds. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> on what date was the first version of Ubuntu Warty Warthog released? Ooh, okay. Was it A, the 20th of October, 2004? Mm-hmm. Was it B, the 21st of October, oh. 2005? Was it C, the 20th of September, 2004? Or was it D, the 10th of October, 2004? I this. I think I do too. Sorry, can you repeat the answers? No. <laughs> yes, I can. Was it A, the 20th of October, 2004? Was it B, 
the 21st of October 2005? Was it C, the 20th of September 2004? Or was it D, the 10th of October 2004? Right, I think it's either A or D, because I'm pretty sure it was 10 of... What, what's the what's the numbering convention again? <laughs> I'm not sure. I, Alan doesn't... Uh, I am incredulous absolutely. that he would be allowed this help. I'm not even going to say I'm going to protest. Um, <laughs> oh, I'm going to go with A. Okay, so you're saying that the first version of Ubuntu was released on 20th of October 2004. Apparently. <laughs> Apparently. <laughs> not, not, not very confident about that? Um... It's a bit of a guess, I'll be honest. It's a one in four chance. Final answer? Yep. <laughs> I know whether you're right. <laughs> or whether you're wrong. Right. After this break. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. I was beginning to wish I'd read the show notes a bit more carefully. You're on fire. <laughs> We're going to have to speed this up Ooh, a bit. Ouch. Of, um, that was an on-fire joke, was it? Okay. Yeah. So the final question you have got <laughs> is, question number six, how many people have marked bug number one as affecting them <laughs> as of the 18th of October when I wrote this up? Is it A, 868? Is it B, 993? Is it C, 1008? Is it D, 1024? C. <laughs> that's a quick answer. It's definitely C. Okay, you sure? Why not? Let's find out. <laughs> we'll be here all night otherwise. Yeah, you're too good. <laughs> you got too far through. <laughs> Do what Laura didn't go out after one question. Uh. Let's find out whether you're right. <clears throat> oh, oh, oh. I was so sure. So there's still a chance. Unlucky. So Mark got five points on that, which is really good. Laura's on one point. <clears throat> and uh, Mark is now on fives. And the third round of questions goes to Alan. Alan, question Are you going to tell him what the right answer was to that? Oh, oh yeah. yeah, it was 993. Oh, that was my second guess. It's 1010 now. Yeah, that's why I said it when I wrote it on the 18th of... Uh, yeah, I know, I'll yeah. just point it out. Okay, well, that's good. Uh, or it's getting worse, one or the other. Right, Alan, question number one for you. Ubuntu is a fork or derivative of which Linux distribution? Is it A, Slackware? Is it B, Debian? <laughs> is it C, Red Hat? Or is it D, Tiny Sofa Linux? <laughs> I absolutely wasn't listening. Is it B, Debian? Was B, Debian? <laughs> yes, B <laughs> was Debian. <laughs> sorry. Do pay attention. But sorry. Yeah, B, pay Debian. Attention, double Debian. Look, just skip You'd this and tell me I'm right. <laughs> right. <laughs> okay, your second question. You've got a minute left. <laughs> Ubuntu community team member Daniel Holbach is famous for which sign of affection? Is it A, hugs? Is it B, foot massages? <laughs> Is it C, putting sweet little notes inside Ubuntu packages? Or is it D, redecorating Ubuntu members' houses while they're on holiday? <laughs> was the first one hugs? The first one was hugs. It's hugs. The drums are playing. <laughs> okay. Okay, things start to get a little more difficult. You've still got both lifelines left. Music purchased through Ubuntu One is provided by which vendor? A, iTunes, B, Amazon MP3, C, 7 Digital, or D, Pirate Bay? <laughs> C7 Digital I'm going to get the drums out again Final answer Yes Yes that's my final answer Okay I've done better on both of their questions so far Three <laughs> questions oh. left Two, two lifelines intact Which architectures does Ubuntu officially support In 11.10 Is it A i386 and AMD64 Is it B i386 AMD64 and ARM is it C, i386, AMD64, and PPC? Or is it D, i386, AMD64, ARM, and PPC? Uh, uh, <laughs> you've still got both of Officially life. support. Officially support. Is that the wording? Yep. As in, you can buy support for it. Oh. Oh. Uh, hmm. I would think... Probably, I would like to ask IRC. Okay, Alan, you have chosen to ask IRC. So, so what, were the, what were the four options? The four Is options are, a... which architectures does Ubuntu officially support in 11.10? A, i386 and AMD64. B, i386, <laughs> AMD64 and ARM. C, i386, AMD64 and PPC. 
or D, i386, AMD64, ARM, and BBC. I think there is quite a delay for some people because somebody's is. just answered seven digital. <laughs> we'll send someone licking goldfish. Well, yeah, I, I don't get that. that That's the next um, question. Hang on, Mark. You're not supposed to be giving answers in IRC. That's not helpful. <laughs> Sabotage. Um, uh, okay, so not PPC. I'm, I'm pretty sure it's not PPC. Definitely i386 and AMD64. But they've all got that in them. So it's got to be the one that is i386, AMD64 and ARM. Is that your final answer? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So you're saying... And some people have confirmed this in IRC. You're saying B, R386, AMD64, and ARM. Yes. Which is B. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> We're two minutes over. We haven't got much feedback. <laughs> <laughs> you might be two minutes over. <laughs> oh, what? Really? Oh, that's what I'd have guessed Although as well. Although there is an ARM build, it's not an officially... <sighs> supported version. Totally Sorry. Enough. Oh, that music's still going. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Sorry, unlucky there, Alan, which is a shame because the last couple of questions are Yeah, clearly okay. the audience isn't always right. Thank you, Taris. Yeah. <laughs> yes, you still have one lifeline left, but you don't get any prizes for that. Um, so Mark is the winner. He got five points. Hooray, so that counts yay, as a one well win done, for the overall leaderboard. Uh, unlucky Alan and unlucky Laura. You did very well. You both did very well. Have you had a good time? Yeah. Oh, you fair home. Mark has won a speedboat. Brilliant. Just before we move on. Oh, yes. I'm doing the quiz next time. And in keeping with last time, uh, I have a survey for you to fill in to help me work out how much the answers are going to be worth. Um, if you're a fan of the BBC quiz show Pointless, it might be something like that. Uh, uh-huh. But for legal reasons, at, at least very slightly did. different. So you're going to give a URL that people click on and they do something at that URL, but we're not allowed to go to that URL. Yeah. You ba- okay. They basically fill out a quick survey and depending on how many answers they give is, well, what, how many people give each answer is how many points you score for that answer in the next show. Uh, but I'll explain that more next time. The URL is is.gd slash uupcquiz. It's just like Ooh. a Google spreadsheet form thing. Um, if chuck you could it, fill chuck it, it out, in the IRC channel and get yes. them to do it as well. If you could there. fill it out, I'd be very grateful. I'll be tweeting it and stuff as well throughout the next couple of weeks. And we've all promised not to cheat. Yes. Okay. And to look at it, not look at it. Not look at it. I'm just grateful you're not doing only connect, <laughs> which is very hard. You guys watch a lot of quiz shows. No, we don't. Is that the Victoria Curran one? Uh, yes. Don't you dare say a bad word about Victoria Corrin. We're not. Oh, God. Okay. That's, that's who he's got on speed dial when he says, I love you on his phone. <laughs> <laughs> Dials Victoria Corrin. <laughs> right, let's get on with the show. And now it's time for the bit about Ubuntu. Phew. Ooh, no one said it. No. Uh, Gerald. Because Alan's lost in a Victoria Corrin-based reverie. (laughs) (laughs) And the first thing in the bit this week is that the new community council has been duly elected. Yes. Yes. And they've all been added to the mailing list. And um, so if you contact the community council, you get through to these fine, fine people. Yeah, much better than that last lot. (laughs) Bunch of losers. Yeah. So how does your newfound freedom feel, Alan? Great. Excellent. (laughs) As Mark put it, you can enjoy the uh, Ubuntu community without any of the responsibility. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, well. Um, And uh, what's next then? Uh, The Vodafone Webbook, a low-spec netbook designed primarily for use online, has been launched in South Africa and runs Ubuntu. Ooh. It costs about 120 quid for the, the prepaid option or something like that. And then there's a 12-month extra, um, which is a few quid more. But it's only available in South Africa. They're looking at maybe making it available in other areas as well. Looks rather nice. Yeah, it's, it's all right. It's hardware. Yeah. It's nice. I wonder if the South African connection with Mark is 
the, the reason they've gone with it. You vaguely went into a South African accent then. Did I? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. But, but, but not South enough. African, not <laughs> yeah. intentionally. Not harder. as good as Alan's in the pantomime last year. Yeah, there might be a comeback for my strange <laughs> South African accent in the uh, Christmas edition again this year. <laughs> yeah, okay. And uh, on the subject of Mark, he has blocked... <laughs> I thought you were saying on the subject of strange South Africans. <laughs> <laughs> nope, I did not. <laughs> no, and I definitely didn't either. <laughs> okay. Mark Shuttleworth has blogged in response to the concerns we spoke about last week regarding participation in the community. Um, we were talking about uh, community and how involved people feel, and he's uh, written some words about it. Yeah. Uh, which are good. <laughs> no comment. Yeah. There's, well, there's a lot of... There's, there's lots lot, of words. There's lots, well, there's of, lots comments of comments on the, the blog post he's written about. It's good. Yeah, it's obviously something that people are aware of and hopefully we'll be spending some time thinking about. Hmm. And it's Ubuntu's seventh birthday. Yay. You know that, don't you, Mark? I do now. Uh, that's how I knew the answer to Mark's question, because uh, I'd read mine of Sherlock's. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I, when I wrote, I, know, yeah. I wrote that question in April, oh. when it was less topical. Oh, okay. There we go. But yeah, that's a long time. It's come a long way. Yeah. Haven't we come a long way? Yeah. Well done. <laughs> and Ubuntu 12.04 LTS will be very LTS. It will have an extended support period on the desktop, which... So it'll now be supported by five years. Not which three. Not three and not two and not, not four. four. But so, five. <laughs> uh, and yeah, so that matches what it's, what it's supported on servers for. What, what do they do with Firefox? <laughs> uh, well, um, that's a good question. Uh, uh, keep getting updates, I guess. Yeah, because Chrome just updates itself, doesn't it? Uh, well, Chrome isn't in the repositories. So no, Chromium oh, right, yeah. is, but Chrome isn't. So I'm I'm not sure what they're going to do with Firefox actually on the but <laughs> what to do with a problem like yeah. Firefox. To do about Firefox. <laughs> well, it's, it's interesting to see them go to five years because if you think about Windows XP, which was around, which was the current release for about five years of Windows, mm. and it really has stuck around for another two or three years beyond that, it, it makes much yeah. more sense to have a long term, a longer term desktop cycle than just three years. Uh, I'm not sure I'd want to have to upgrade a whole company desktop estate 60,000 users or 600,000 users every two or three years mm, whereas yeah. hardware changes every five years in that kind of organisation really doesn't it yeah a lot of people have five year desktop cycles and they're also going to put out the point releases in LTS like they usually do so there'll be a, a 12.04.1 and a 12.04.2 which will have updated drivers and bug okay. fixes mm. that's the idea hardware, hardware enablement in the point releases so that if a new like Dell laptop comes out that's not supported by 12.04 you can you oh, can that's install good. a later one. Yeah, mm-hmm. they they already do that for LTS releases, oh, okay. but it will make a lot more sense in a in a release that's supported for five years. Yeah, I did have um when I posted that we were um to check if anyone wanted to report any news. I did have someone tweet saying that this is going to make a huge difference for them. So it's obviously a popular decision. Mm. Good amongst that one person. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> it's very popular for him. Um, for and finally, uh, in the about Ubuntu. Uh, Jono has collated the results of the community survey and uh, we mentioned last time and published them with pretty graphs and lots of citations as well. Yes, uh, his blog post where he said, you only really need to read the first 28 pages of this PDF. <laughs> yeah. yeah, can you give Thanks, us a summary Jono. of that? Yeah, here's yeah. the 28 page summary. TL semicolon. Well, it's, you know, it's actually worth a read and worth ploughing through because... Uh, there's some interesting tidbits about how the community feels about Ubuntu and how they feel about Canonical and the relationship between the two. And uh, I think um, from the 300 and something people who responded, he's got a lot of good feedback. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's enough of a sample size to be significant, isn't it? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And in the not about Ubuntu, uh, Linux Mint's next release will feature initial support for GNOME 3 with a view to the distribution switching to the newer desktop in upcoming releases. So GNOME 3 was the thing that Ubuntu chose not to use, no, the GNOME shell. GNOME shell is yeah, what sorry, yes. we chose not to yeah, use. Okay. Yeah, it's tricky. Um, I don't know whether what Linux Mint are going to do about uh, desktop-wise. I mean, they'll go to GNOME 3, and whether they'll have the fallback as the default or whether they'll have GNOME shell as the default, mm. given the amount of resistance there's been in other distros like Ubuntu, like Fedora, yeah. resistance to the GNOME shell, I don't know. Well, one thing that um, they said was that they're going to look at having either... Gnome 2 or I can't remember the name of the project which is carrying on Gnome 2 um, trying to have some sort of support for that to run as well as having run Gnome 3 so interesting. it could be that users will still have the option to run whatever they prefer but it will be Gnome 3 by default presumably yes you too can run 
old unsupported software on your modern desktop. <laughs> I can do that anyway. Exactly. <laughs> it's from Debian. Hey. Yeah. hey. Oh, and that's all in the bit about and not about Ubuntu this time. Ali1234, who apparently goes by the much less plausible name of Alistair Buxton, Buxton uh, on IRC, reprimanded Popey for his explanation of multi-arch because it was... Completely wrong. Ah, <laughs> fancy that. Multi-arch is a multi-chipset thing. For example, you can install ARM packages on an x86 machine for use with QEMU. Also, old i386 debs from the likes of Amazon won't work properly with it. Packages have to be specially made to work with it. I consider myself schooled. Mm. So what sort of things would you use multi-arch for then? Well, for exactly as as um, Alistair says, installing stuff that's not for the chipset that you're currently running. So especially if you're doing cross-compiling or you want to test some ARM stuff and you're currently running AMD 64, rather than have to go and get the package and compile it, you should be able to do apt get install package name colon ARM or whatever the, the architecture name is and go and get it from the repository without having to do much in the way of shenanigans as long as somebody's repackaged it to make as long it work. as someone has actually built it to yeah, yeah be multi-arch aware and all that okay i'm sure it's cool but it's perhaps slightly less useful than we thought mm, perhaps well, it's basically quicker than going to packages.ubuntu.com getting the deb and then doing dpackage force architecture <laughs> saves you having yes. to do that basically well i'm not sure that would work very well anyway but yeah exactly okay and alistair munro emailed with this advice on vi if you ever get thrown in at the deep end on Unix systems at work, VI is generally the only way you can guarantee the only way you can guarantee will be there. Yeah, uh, sorry. <laughs> even Emacs isn't always about. Well, yeah, that's true. Uh, VI also works well over SSH or Telnet console sessions. Other editors might not map keystrokes very well over these simple connections, or they don't display very well in a small terminal window. If you learn VI, you can generally always edit the files in situ on the remote machine without having to faff about dragging the file back to your machine. In short, VI rocks. I have actually found that if I'm logged into something which only has a serial interface, like my Guru plug, getting a text editor working across that connection can be a bit flaky, but VI or Vim just works very I'm, well. I'm, I'm, I'm really getting to grips. I've read, someone posted a really good um, cheat sheet chart for, for Vim, um, which has the navigation keys uh, listed, but in a really logical way, showing them going left and right for backwards and forwards and up and down for up and down. It, it just looks really nice. So I've got that posted up on my desk at work. Yeah, I use Vi whenever I'm admining a server over Telnet. <laughs> <laughs> and finally, the wing commander is contemplating the future. Commander Sir Arthur Curmudgeon here. After listening to your piece on cloud computing, I was disappointed not to hear anything at all about computing whilst airborne. Wrong type of clouds. But it got me thinking how people of my generation keep asking what happened to the future we were promised, mainly talking about the personal jetpack and the flying car. I was given the job of testing the expendable jetpack at de Havilland in the 70s. It singularly failed to get off the ground and merely set fire to my trousers, thereby ruining a perfectly decent pair of tweeds. Can you imagine the chaos if we all had flying cars? Most of the old crumblies in my street can't even land a stanner stairlift. Half of them would hit the electricity pylons because they were busy chatting on their eye smug. I expect they would all run Ford Touch on Windows 8 or some such, skip through the media player, and the whole thing flips upside down, crashing into the ground in a blazing fireball. Adds a whole new meaning to the blue screen of death. What? Must dash, that's my Swedish masseuse, come to give me my rub down. Over and out, the WC. <laughs> Still alive then. <laughs> <laughs> and kicking, it seems. Yes. <laughs> well, as ever, that was it. Truly enlightening. Um, yeah, more from him next time, probably. Let's play some music.
that's all for this episode thank you for listening and you can find out how to get in touch with us on our website podcast.ubuntu-uk.org including voicemail numbers and twitter feeds facebook and irc channels let us know what you think of the show or give us your thoughts around ubuntu and the community and join us on tuesday the 8th of november for our next live episode that was harder work than usual wasn't it (laughs) (laughs) remember remember the 8th of november yes as i believe the rhyme doesn't go it's definitely time for some cake, though, I think. Oh, right. yeah. Oh, yes. Carrot cake today. It is. Oh, yes. Oh, very nice carrot cake. Brought by Alan. No, brought by my wife. Oh, right. Well, thank you, Claire. Yes. She, oh, she'll definitely be listening right now at the yeah. end of the show. <laughs> yes. And, of course, hello to Amy Ferguson. See you next time. <laughs> Bye-bye. <laughs> Lady. <Lainey. laughs>